So now that we've established what a recessively inherited disorder is all about, we can finally start looking at some real life, really, really relevant examples in humans um, that show up all the time. Classic, classic examples of what we consider recessively inherited disorder. So I'll continue that discussion with this next flowchart. Uh, we'll call it recessively inherited disorders. Um, Roman numeral 2. We're going to do some real-life examples by looking at two basic types of these recessively inherited disorders, two real-life examples. So, a lot of times students have this complaint that general biology isn't relevant. Well, it's about to get very, very relevant to you right now. First type of recessively inherited disorder we're going to discuss is known as cystic fibrosis, often just abbreviated as CF. So this is a classic, classic type of recessively inherited disorder in humans. So cystic fibrosis, just some background information, is actually the most common lethal disease in the U.S., okay? It's the most common, we'll call it lethal, lethal disease in the U.S., okay? Lethal meaning that it eventually results in the death of the individual. So this is very serious right now. And also, cystic fibrosis, as sort of another side note we can state, is very common um, in the European descent. So we'll say Euro descent has a common sort of... Uh, common denominator of oftentimes having cystic fibrosis. Um, they usually have it in about one out of every 2,500 cases, okay? One out of every 2,500 people of European descent has cystic fibrosis. So, again, those are background information uh, ideas to keep in mind. Now let's actually look at the genetics behind it. So, the big idea behind human genetics, this whole lecture is looking at normal and then looking at abnormal. So let's do this. First, let's look at the normal cystic fibrosis allele, okay, for... Uh, lack of a better phrase. So let's look at the normal allele. In the normal allele, we get the following scenario. And now the scenario is a bit wordy, but stay with me. It'll make a lot of sense. In the normal situation, somebody who doesn't have CF, they will do the following. Their normal allele does a great normal job and codes for a protein. Okay, so again, this is just central dogma of biology. Codes for protein that forms a specific function, that does a specific function. What's that function? Codes for protein that transports, so it's a transport protein, we know all about that, transports what we call chloride ions. This is a critical, critical transport that needs to happen successfully and correctly. Chloride ions, what we would say between cells and what we call their extracellular fluid. So ECF stands for extra cellular fluid. Everything, all the fluid that's outside of the cell. Not within, not intracellular fluid, but extracellular fluid. So normal allele, you have this transport protein, okay? This transport protein that moves chloride ions, which are known as Cl- ions, in and out of the cell correctly and efficiently. That's our normal situation for cystic fibrosis. Well, what happens if we have a recessive allele? Now, you should already be understanding what a recessive allele will do, what the consequence of a recessive allele is, because this is all about recessively inherited disorders. This is going to be a lethal disease, thus a lethal allele that is recessive if inherited in a recessive form. So, in this situation, what we have is that the protein channels, the protein uh, transport proteins, let's say, the protein channels in other term, in other words, um, either will do one or the other. They will either be defective, remember how we said that the, there might be a malfunction, or what was the other option? If there's not a malfunction, they just might not be there entirely. They might be missing entirely. So this is absolutely lethal. This is a very bad situation, and when would we see this? The person who has cystic fibrosis, because this is a recessively inherited disorder, will only have cystic fibrosis if they are homozygous recessive. So we'll say if homo recessive, okay, so this is the only time you have cystic fibrosis. If you have both recessive alleles, if you're expressing both ex uh, rece recessive alleles, you have the following uh, problem. You will have a very, very, very high concentration 
So in concentration, we can write this down as Cl minus with brackets. This means high, with the arrow, increased chloride ion concentration in the extracellular fluid. So you know in normal cells, the Cl minus easily goes in and out of the cells and sort of reaches a state at which it is normal where it is going in and out at a correct volume. In this situation, all of this chloride ion builds up on the outside over and over and over. It accumulates on the outside. What is the problem with this? It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. It's just an ion, right? Well, it's a huge, huge deal because this actually causes an increase in very thick mucus, okay? You get a very thick mucus increase with in your body and specifically this will result when you have a lot of mucus buildup what happens to you when you get sick and there's a lot of mucus buildup let's say you start coughing a lot right and you feel really really uh, have a difficulty breathing this is exactly what happens in CF individuals they end up having very serious respiratory problems and these problems arise almost uh, into let's say adolescence they barely get out of or into adolescence and unfortunately because of its leth lethality I think that's a word because of its lethalness let's say the people with CF actually do die very early on because this is an absolutely terrible terrible thing to happen so again cystic fibrosis normal versus abnormal normal allele recessive allele so normal allele otherwise known as dominant allele recessive allele is when we have problems if it's homo recessive we have big problems lethal problems we could say and finally um, in uh, the next part we're going to be talking about a different type of recessively inherited disorder called sickle cell disease okay or sickle cell anemia some people say but we'll call it sickle cell disease just to be a little more general so again I'm going to start off by giving you a bit of background information this is most common in people with that are of African descent so it's let's say um, common in African descent whereas that was common in European descent not a big deal in the US per se much big deal much bigger deal in Africa and we'll see why so I'm just going to give you a basic background of sickle cell disease and we'll look at more of the greater genetic implications in the next flowchart. So the basic idea behind sickle cell disease is the following. Let's look at the cause very quickly. The cause is very simple. All that happens in sickle cell disease is what we consider a one amino acid substitution. This one substitution, one mistake, simply one mistake this is actually one point mutation one mistake in the DNA causes one mistake in the amino acid in what we call hemoglobin a critical 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 protein in us so it's called HEMO globin G L O B I N in hemoglobin of what we call red blood cells so basic idea behind red blood cells is that red blood cells carry oxygen for us. That's their number one job. But in order for them to carry oxygen for us, they have a protein within them called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the actual protein that does the function of carrying oxygen. So remember, gene codes for protein, central dog land, that protein carries out specific function. Gene codes for hemoglobin, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Gene codes for hemoglobin, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Here we have a problem. There's a substitution. The gene does not code for the correct version of hemoglobin. What do I mean by this? Well, let's see the following. Hemoglobin, background information, HB is an abbreviation for hemoglobin, is four polypeptide chains, PPC, in a what we consider quaternary structure. So it's a very advanced, very sort of a fancy looking protein in a very high structure. That consists of two alpha, uh, let's say, portions and also to what we consider beta portions. This is the point at which we have problems in hemoglobin that is part of sickle cell disease. At the two beta portions, at the two beta strands, this is where we have a specific mutation. So we'll say MUT for mutation is here. And when we have a mutation at the beta strand, we simply have the following switch. We go from glue, which is an amino acid, glutamic acid, and we turn that accidentally into valine. This is, seems like it's not that big of a deal. You're going from glue, glutamic acid to valine. Okay, doesn't that really not change much? It's just one amino acid, right? Well, that actually changes a whole lot in the sense that 
the hemoglobin now does not have a normal quaternary, um, let's say, round structure. It actually forms crystals, okay? Forms crystal-like structures because of this simple change, okay? This chemical change going from gl glutamic acid to valine is detrimental. It's very, very bad. You need the glutamic acid to form a normal hemoglobin. Now you're forming hemoglobin that makes crystals. And because this hemoglobin makes crystals, and because hemoglobin is found within red blood cells, you get what are called sickle red blood cells. And sickle red blood cells have a what we consider crescent shape. Okay, They have sort of a crescent shape. So a normal red blood cell looks sort of roundish like this, so draw that in. It has nice hemoglobin within it, but a sickle red blood cell has a crescent shape and looks like this. And this is going to cause a very, very big problem. This is sort of a sickle shape right here, crescent shape right here. This is abnormal because of one amino acid substitution. What's the substitution? Glutamic acid to valine because of a mutation at the beta strand causing a disruption in the four polypeptide quaternary structure of hemoglobin. So that's a lot of information. How is this going to be applied to us? I just gave you the normal showed you a bit of the abnormal. Let me show you a full idea of what we mean by abnormal red blood cells. What do they cause? So abnormal RBCs. So we established abnormality by looking at this crescent shape because of the following stuff that just happened. So what happens if we have abnormal red blood cells? What's the big deal? Well, there are two crucial and critical and let's say lethal consequences. Either these abnormal blood cells will be destroyed immediately, meaning that the body will recognize that the um, glutamic acid has been switched to valine and thus crystals are being formed, the sickle red blood cells are being formed, and the body says, you know what, I don't want to keep any of these sickle red blood cells. I'm going to destroy them immediately because they're wrong. Okay, destroy it immediately, let's say, because they're will say wrong for lack of a better word and because they're wrong and because they're destroyed what you actually do is you decrease something critical in every single one of us you decrease O2 meaning oxygen carrying capacity you decrease your ability to hold oxygen and if we know anything from cell respiration it's that every single cell needs oxygen to live because oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor and you can't have ATP without accepting that terminal electron and all that stuff. All of that stuff, if you have a problem with oxygen, that is a critical problem because it will eventually lead to a terrible, terrible state of anemia. That means you have a very, very poor, very, very weak individual because they cannot and do not have enough oxygen circulating within them. Thus, they do not have enough energy. Thus, they have a huge amount of problems, overall considered anemia. That's why it's often called sickle cell anemia. So you either destroy the sickle cells and then you end up with anemia or you get this problem of the following. Either the red blood cells, maybe they don't get destroyed. They could eat, because of their awkward shape, they clump together. Okay, This is a bad shape for red blood cells because they have to actually go through very tight vessels. Very, very tight, um, red, um, let's say, blood vessels. And this is a bad, bad shape to go through that because it causes clumping. And if they clump together, this actually slows down blood flow, let's say. And if we slow down blood flow, this is going to cause another terrible, terrible problem. This will actually block, like I was alluding to, small vessels. This blocks uh, small blood vessels, okay? And if you block small blood vessels, you eventually will result in widespread tissue damage. And if you have widespread tissue damage, you will have very, very bad cases of pain throughout the body. So there's actually a combination of both of these events in people that have sickle cell disease. In the next video, we're going to be looking at the genetic implications of this. Now that we understand what it is, what's normal, what's abnormal of sickle cell disease, we're going to look at the overarching genetic results of this recessively inherited disorder.